Peggy 3 More than anything else, I am the most excited to depict what the near future of space flight may look like. How do we get to actually freighting things back and forth between planets and, and making commuter trips to all of these planets? What does that look like in reaching that point? We are proposing in Kerbal Space Program 2 technologies that would facilitate that. There was a program called Project Orion that was in the 50s and 60s specifically intended to develop this technology that involved spitting out tiny nuclear bombs and exploding them against a pusher plate that was attached to a vehicle by giant shock absorbers. And they got as far as conducting experiments with pusher plates and explosives in the real world. And it was the partial nuclear test ban treaty that put the kibosh on Project Orion. Had that not occurred, we would probably be hauling stuff around the solar system with nuclear pulse rockets today. With KSP-2, we're expanding the tech tree to accommodate colonization and interstellar travel. We have a lot of different kinds of engines, a lot of different kinds of vehicles that you can build. We started digging into the research and we discovered that there is in fact a speculative possible fuel type called metallic hydrogen. Metastable metallic hydrogen, in the very broadest sense, can be about twice as powerful as any known chemical propellant that's used today. We went to our subject matter expert at the University of Washington, Dr. Yuri Schumlach, and we said, we want to make some metallic hydrogen rockets, and here's some doodles. And I'm like, could you put radiator fins on it? He talked us through the heat management issues that we would be dealing with. Every architecture decision that we made around the shapes of these engines is about optimizing their ability to stay cool. We talked about different ways of doping metallic hydrogen. We have atmosphere-rated metallic hydrogen engines with water. And then for the later generations of metallic hydrogen, you're using magnetic nozzles in deep space to channel the combustion products of metallic hydrogen mixed with cesium. What the cesium will do is it will allow your exhaust and your metallic hydrogen to be affected by magnets. Your exhaust is no longer actually touching large parts of your rocket assembly. So it is not transferring the majority of its ridiculous 6,000 Kelvin heat to the rest of your rocket. So it can safely fly through the vacuum of space with absurd amounts of force. However, this does not function in atmosphere. You have to get creative about, all right, at what point do I break off from my metallic hydrogen engine because I don't want to try to land on it and use my more standard lander. And how do I re-link to that later if I want to? Metallic hydrogen engines are fantastic upgrades from the standard KSP-1 Methalox engines. They just expand what you are able to do in general. There will be metallic hydrogen fuel factories in our game. It's one of many things that you do at a colony which is part of the reason you need colonies in our game, is because you need to be able to synthesize some of these more exotic fuels. And synthesizing it is an unsolved engineering problem. If we are able to create a quantity of this stuff, and more importantly, figure out a material to build an engine and a rocket out of that can actually withstand the extreme heat of burning this stuff, it completely changes the nature of space travel. It's really exciting to be able to depict that and what that might look like and give you the chance to play with it in Kerbal Space Program 2. I was sitting down with Aaron, our effects artist, and trying to figure out what the exhaust for this engine was supposed to look like. And I have a notion of what a rocket looks like in a vacuum, so we kind of started from there and put it in front of Yuri Schumlach, and he wrote back one of the coolest emails I've ever read in my life black body radiation, chemical properties of metallic hydrogen. He went way, way deep on this thing, all to tell us that it would be pink. <laughs> no, really?
So then we were like, all right, the science is there. Let's figure out what uh, this pink exhaust would look like. And we built it up. And the result is like nothing you've ever seen before. Before, every part exploded the same. Whether it was landing gear, you know, a radar dish, a fuel tank, it didn't matter. We wanted to expand on uh, the launch and on explosions and really on the exhaust to make it a little more toward real life. We had to come up with a system that would know what type of fuel it is, how much fuel it has, where is it in an atmosphere or in a vacuum, and then create a system that would present the proper explosion. We built in some randomness just to make sure that no matter what, you would get a different looking explosion. There's so many different things that can happen. It's just really cool to see that depending on what you create, it's gonna have a different reaction to the world and where you are. You know, for me, one of the fun things about Kerbal Space Program is actually crashing. Sometimes to figure out some of the reactions, I do some experiments at home. You know, you learn a lot from that. It's a fun thing to do, and sometimes I build stuff just to watch it blow up. After you've fully explored the Kerbaler system, there's a whole new category of engines that you move into. They're capable of burning for months or years. Brachistochrone trajectories, interstellar engines. Their potential top speed is very, very high. There is a fourth category of engine that becomes accessible very late in the game, which I would describe as a torch ship engine. This is sort of the holy grail. It is a torch that you ride, screaming white death. We just keep finding really, really cool things about what these technologies actually do. We have the task and the privilege here of depicting the near future of space travel and how we are going to get from a single planet civilization to a multi-planet species.